The poignant and tragic scenes of desperation at the Kabul International Airport on Monday, 16th of August 2021, manifest the very crumbling of democracy itself, to me at least, in my view and vision. Indeed, Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan nailed the pretense on its head, literally, by mouthing what none of us were willing to say. He said that the cultural slavery shackled to the West has ended. Did he imply that culturally Afghanistan is not predisposed to public order and uh, governance that any democratic dispensation will usher in? Or did he mean to say that democratic order is anathema to Afghanistan's feudal ethos? Amazing and shocking statement coming from the Prime Minister, an elected Prime Minister of a pretentious democracy. Don't you think so? Yes, definitely. The self-appointed global policemen of the world, the United States of America, sent soldiers not statesmen or women, not activists, intellectuals or entrepreneurs for nation-building of war-torn Afghanistan. Indeed, the USA has always opposed nation-building and does not blink when having to send soldiers abroad. But to what avail? Policing for what? Cynics say to protect America's interests like fossil fuel reserves in oil-rich countries. In the aftermath of the tragic 9-11 terror attacks in New York and Washington, the then Republican government of President George Bush had to be seen to be taking action against the terror perpetrators. So an ill-advised, hurriedly cobbled alliance strung out war resources more eventually than strategically. The offensive was launched on the 8th of October 2001 to exterminate the Taliban, a gun-running militia, entrenched in the political vacuum abandoned by a powerless, defunct regime led by the apologetic Najibullah government, if you remember, heretofore in power that was seen as factotums of the invading Russians. It was also an oft-bandied allegation that the alliance was intentionally avoiding capture of Osama bin Laden, who was captured nearly a decade after the Afghan offensive was launched back in the mid-90s. I remember Najibullah was hung, poor guy, on a, on a tree in 1996 as the Taliban invaded Afghanistan. It is not a coincidence that another Republican, President Donald Trump it was, who galvanized the need to disengage militarily from Afghanistan, obviously because it didn't pay them anything. Pray, why did the hugely popular Democratic President Joe Biden hurry to disengage the military from Afghanistan? That too, when negotiations between the Ashraf Ghani government and the Taliban was at an end stage. What exactly did the US seek to achieve by stepping into Afghanistan, one wonders, you know? By deploying boots on the ground, the successive US governments have only pandered to the arms dealers lobby and has not succeeded anywhere in the post-Cold War period in either eliminating terrorism or ushering in grassroots democracy. Vietnam, after struggling for decades, is emerging as an economic power rather than a democratic one. Grassroots democracy is missing in all the former qualities and amphitheatres of Cold War. India is the only sparkling exception in the Commonwealth, where democratic credentials and institutions are firmly entrenched. The US sent soldiers, not statesmen, entrepreneurs, philanthropists and activists. Soldiers tried to eliminate the unseen enemy of terrorism and only bred more terror, like in Iraq and Syria. Although we must underscore that oil bereft Syria did not particularly enthuse America's boots on the ground. This would not have been the case if America had not gone warmongering, you know. Instead, if there was UN Security Council backed coalition seeking to install democracy instead of vengeful attacks, this might not perhaps have been the case. Similar is the case in Iraq. Late former Secretary General Mr. Kofi Annan had in fact said in an interview that the Second Gulf War was not sanctioned by the UN Security Council and remains an illegal occupation by foreign forces. Building and nurturing grassroots democracy calls for institutionalizing democratic institutions, which is arguably a tall order, but necessary singular in its idealistic path and not meant for compromise all the same. Talks with the Afghan government in Doha should have fructified before the US administration decided to disengage on the ground in Afghanistan. 
But what needs to be done now? The need of the hour is to deploy UN peacekeeping forces. The UN ste must step in without further delay. The UN Security Council, under the current leadership of India, must install a transitionary government under the UNSC's resolve and management to intently work on grassroots democracy at the village level with an election commission in place. India can play a leading role in establishing trained personnel, institutionalizing free and fair elections with electronic voting machines and the legal framework for an evolving constitution and drafting laws for grassroots democracy to take hold. WTO and other fiscal institutions like the IMF must ensure economic investment, harvest skilled talent and educated human resources in the country. A trained police force deployed for internal security, a free press, a robust civil society, a functional judiciary must be put in place by such a transitory government. These priorities will ensure a smooth flow of investment, employment opportunities, economic progress, food security, livelihood security, education, research and development. Then other priorities like disaster mitigation, environmental sustainability will all have to be instituted. Needless to reiterate, there has to be a timeline for the functioning of the transitory government. Taliban spokesman's statement in Doha that Sharia law will be implemented and women's rights will be respected. Women will not be restricted from coming or to work or study holds little water and lesser credibility, you know. Of course, it was very wrong on the part of the incumbent president, Ashraf Ghani, to flee that too reportedly after looting the treasury. But when compared to the possibility of bloodshed, his fleeing the imminent war raza can possibly be justified as a peace gesture, even if in cowardice. The former President Ghani is a cancer survivor, adds modicum of legitimacy to safe passage from a bloody horizon of war. Without handing over power, without negotiating a deal, Ghani fleeing the war-torn nation tantamines to abandoning attempts at a fragile peace. The US cannot absolve itself of all responsibility. It should have tried to initiate democratization in the 20-year period instead of just policing. USA did not try to democratize a failed state. If only the befuddled Afghan president Ashraf Ghani had announced in parliament that he was stepping down to usher in a peaceful transition of power, there would have been a modicum of legitimacy to the usurpers. The transition would have been longer but legit, perhaps. Compare this to humiliated Germany after the Second World War. Germany embraced democracy and all things politically right, even if the fatherland was pounded economically. Allied powers oversaw a transition to a healthy functional democracy and it led to Germany rising like a phoenix. Similar was the case with bomb Japan. This was completely a miss in both Afghanistan and Iraq. It reflects the absence of the US involvement. Germany, an economic powerhouse, will surely be able to guide the economic transition under a transparent, efficient government. Having been embittered in both world wars and having risen to be the most powerful economic power in the world today, Germany is the strongest position ethically and fiscally to be able to assist any transitory government in Afghanistan. Be it the Taliban or the ISIS or any other terror outfit, terrorism has its roots in economic despair and its tentacles in society. Eliminating terrorism calls for investment, economic growth and job creation, infrastructure to aid growth and transparent governance, grassroots democratic institutions, legislative democracy, institutional political support, free media, civil society engagement, free and fair elections, political representation, universal adult franchise, inclusive gender perspectives, thrust on education, research and development. These are the hallmarks of a functional and robust democracy. Not one of these can be ushered in either by policing or by abdicating power to the rule of the gun.